Better? Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. I've had the most amazing week in the Chicago area, talking to tons of parents and coaches just like you. I had a great time with your coaches last night. Hopefully some of them emailed you and encouraged you to be here today. I just want to start with a, a quick show of hands. How many of you uh, played sports growing up? All right, so almost everyone, right? Almost everyone has been touched by sports, whether it's just Little League Baseball or soccer or whatever it is. How many of you, another show of hands, think that sports is really different for your kids than it was for you growing up? <laughs> yeah, it's incredibly different. The, the pressures that kids face, the pressures to commit earlier, to do more, the pressure on coaches, this fear of, oh, if we don't get on the right team or if we don't win all our games, it's really, really different. So it's very, very hard to rely upon our experience as a young athlete from a decade or two or three ago when we're trying to raise our own kids today. And, and even my own experience is, is incredibly different. Um, I feel like when I was growing up playing sports, it was all about me and my friends. It was kids competing against other kids. And now when I look around a lot, it, it seems to be adults competing against other adults through their kids. And so, yeah, so, so, this, so this is a very difficult thing, and this is what uh, we're trying to change. So what I want to talk about tonight is, uh, as Carson said, how do we create this player-first environment? How do we take it back to like it was, where, where sports was about the needs and the values and the priorities of our kids? Because this is the environment that actually leads to the best performance. And it's not just in sports, it's in any achievement activity. So you can take what you learned here tonight and put it in school or music or anything else where there's an achievement activity. The principles that we talk about are the same. Now, how did I get here? Well, I, I've been coaching for many years. I was a college player, I was a USL pro player, and uh, then I got to coach college, I got to coach high school, I got to run youth clubs in Vermont and Michigan, and then in Oregon, and about three years ago, I was standing, after all that experience, my, my whole perspective about sports changed standing on the sideline of a six-year-old girls' soccer game. And I was watching my daughter play, and it was the typical six-year-old game, the scrum of players, and it moves up and down, and laughing and giggling, and you know, players scoring, and either goal, it doesn't matter, they don't care, they're equally happy. <laughs> and and, and it, was, it was this perfect sports experience. Coaches were positive, the parents were positive, it made a mistake, they giggled about it. There's no referees to yell at. And so I'm thinking, this is great. This is what sports is supposed to be about. Well, on, on this particular day, right next door, there was a competitive 10-year-old boys game. And it was competitive, not because the kids were competing any harder or trying any harder, but it was the coaches and the parents were competing much harder. And this kid makes a bad pass, and the other team steals it and scores a goal. And his coach jumps off the bench and starts screaming at him, yelling at him, subs him out of the game. And I'm watching this poor 10-year-old boy walking off the field with his head down, and I'm thinking, this is why so many kids walk away from sports. He's here, he's with his friends, he's trying to have fun, and he made a mistake because he's 10. And for that, all these adults that matter to him in his life, his coach, his dad, even some of his friends' parents are angry at him. And this is why they're walking away. So on that day, I said, okay, well, I'm the guy running this gym joint. I'm running this soccer club here. I just need to put in a parent education program. I need, I need to help parents and coaches understand well, what makes kids tick and, and why it's, you know, what, what we do at six on the sidelines is, is okay at 10. And so I looked and I didn't really find it. And that set me on this journey of uh, the Change the Game Project. And I researched and wrote this book, and on this journey I had this just amazing path. I, I kept reading stuff from parenting and psychology and child development and sports science, and I kept saying, why didn't anyone ever teach me this before? Because this would have been really helpful when my kids were born. And it would have been helpful to know when I started coaching, you know, 15, 20 years before. And I interviewed these amazingly intelligent people I also interviewed, I interviewed some of the parents of kids that I had coached, and kids in the club who had older kids, and I asked them, what message would you 
you'd like to pass on to people? What sort of collective wisdom do you think should be passed down? And they kept saying two things. They kept saying, number one, tell people that this goes by very, very fast. And one day your son or your daughter is wearing their first soccer uniform and it goes down to their knees and the socks come up to mid-thigh and the shorts are way, way too big. And then the next day they go off to college. And they also said, tell them that if I knew 10 years ago what I know now about what would be important, I would have done a lot of things differently. Because when my kids were 10, 11, or 12, I thought it was really important that they won the uh, U11 Oregon Cup. They don't remember that. They remember the hotel. <laughs> they remember the van ride. They remember the coach or the adults in their lives that made a positive difference in their lives. That's what they remember. And I also interviewed a lot of kids. And the basic thing the kids kept saying was, tell, tell our parents that we only get one childhood, so let it belong to us. And that became the message of this book, and that became the message of the Change the Game Project. And you see, the, the big challenge is this, and this is why I did this, to try to figure out this. Why in sports now do we behave in a way that we never would behave in any other aspects of our kids' lives. And I want to show you a couple quick videos here to just demonstrate this point. So this first one is my daughter Maggie's seven-year-old piano recital. So she makes two mistakes. Does her piano teacher jump up and criticize her? Do any of the parents feel the need to give input? No, because for some reason we understand that piano is very, very hard. And she's seven, and she's not supposed to be playing a symphony yet. And this is okay. Well, let's contrast this with a seven-year-old soccer game. Little basic piece. 
pieces, one note, one hand at a time. When the game rolls around, it's a symphony. They have to do the whole thing. And we feel compelled sometimes as parents and coaches, coaches are equally guilty, that when they're not playing the whole symphony, we need to fix it. And we're fixing it by yelling and screaming at our kids to go, 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 and do this and do that. And we've taken away control of the game. And the problem with that is this. It's created this environment right now where 7 out of 10 children walk away from youth sports by the age of 13. 3 out of 4 kids are done by high school. And this is very scary because we live in a world now where the statistics on obesity are, are frightening. We live in a world where, according to recent studies, today's 10-year-old children are the first generation in 200 years who have a shorter life expectancy than their parents due to inactivity. We live in a world where our kids aren't really getting positive values from pop culture. And so I think sports plays a more important role than ever if most kids are walking away. And so my goal tonight is this. My goal tonight is to help you to understand some of the issues we face, some of the mythology that surrounds youth sports. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about the psychology of performance, right? What makes kids tick? And what interferes with that performance? And then the third piece, I want to give you three things tonight that you can walk out of here with that will make a huge difference in how your kids play. And in the grand scheme of $300 soccer shoes and $200 balls that bend in 14 different ways and $100 now we're coaching. These three, these three things, they don't cost you a penny. But they make a far bigger difference than any of those things on how much your kids love the game and how much and how well they perform. And so that's the plan. So I want to start with a couple of these things that are issues. And at any time, if you have a question, please ask, because this is about you. And at the end, we're going to have some time for Q&A as well. So if you have a question, and just write it down on your piece of paper there, and we'll try to get as much of this out as possible. But there's a couple of big issues that really affect the current sports environment. And the first one is this. The push for early sports specialization. So, we are now living in a world where our kids are asked to do more and more and more at younger and younger ages. And we have this fear as, as parents sometimes that, well, everyone else is doing it, so I need to do it too. And here's what the science says on early sports specialization. Unless your child is in a sport, uh, female gymnastics and female figure skating, where those athletes hit their athletic peak in their teenage years, if they're a part of a team sport, if they're in soccer, they don't hit their peak until their 20s. And so this push for early specialization, there's no science that says it makes them better later on. Now, who's heard, just show hands, of uh, the idea of 10,000 hours? Just anyone, right? Malcolm Gladwell, popular, I said, book out buyers. Keep your hand up if you know that's not true. Yeah, very few. He made this thing very popular. The 10,000 hour study was a study of elite violinists, and somehow that got turned into, well, everyone needs 10,000 hours. And that the only basket of performance is the practice basket. But you see, performance is not just the practice basket. Right? There's so many things that go into performance. Psychology, genetics, coaching, the social aspects. And so when we put all our eggs in the practice basket and ignore the others, kids drop out, kids quit. And what the science of specialization tells us, and what physicians tell us, what orthopedics tell us, what psychologists tell us, is that kids who specialize very young in sports get injured 70 to 90% more than children who play multi-sports. They don't develop all-around athleticism. They burn out, drop out at a much higher rate. And they're actually far more likely when they drop out to never return to any sport at all. Soccer is a lifetime sport. Tennis is a lifetime. Golf is a lifetime sport. These are sports that can be played for a long, long time. But these kids who drop out and burn out and quit, they don't ever come back even as adults. And again, this feeds into this activity thing, uh, lack of activity. So we have this mythology, and we see so many people saying, oh my god, if my seven-year-old doesn't practice three times a week, my seven-year-old doesn't 
play travel soccer, we're falling behind. But that's not based on any science. That's just based and usually pushed by people who are making money off it. What college coaches say is, hey, I'll take the, I'll take the um, kid who's done multiple sports because he or she probably still has an upside. But if I get an 18-year-old who has, you know, is, is here in soccer, and that's all <coughs> he's ever done, all he's ever done, they're probably a final player. They probably don't have a lot to go. So this is the, the myth of early specialization. The second myth is um, this idea of winning instead of development. That at as young an age as possible, I need to get on the winning team. And then you get on the team that, that um, wins all its games. You need to get on the team, the A team. We need to make cuts. We need to only pick the best kids. Now, this is not an anti-competition message at all. I, I'm a competitive coach. I coach college athletes. I coach national team kids. I'm not about a lack of competition. But what we're doing right now isn't making kids more competitive. And it's not setting them up for long-term success. In the soccer world, most of the developmental academy, the highest level of boys soccer in this country, when I ask them what percentage of your 11-year-old A team players are on your A team at age 18, it's about 10%. It's a 90% turnover. So when we're part of an organization that is making A teams and cutting kids at really young ages, it's a big problem. Because we like to think this, right? We like to think that talent develops in a straight line, but it doesn't. It looks like that thing on the right. It's like one of my son's drawings. It doesn't develop in a straight line. I'm going to tell you the story of a player in England. He was a 15-year-old boy <coughs> about eight years ago. And this player had been a very, very good, very quick 11-year-old, 12-year-old. And then he grew. And he started to struggle. And he was in a, one of the better perfect, uh, English Premier League academies. And so he was 15, going on 16, and the academy wanted to decide should we give him a, a scholarship to continue full time in our academy or should we let him go? And they were split because this kid was struggling. And he was actually only the uh, seventh fastest kid in the program. He used to be the quickest. And so they brought in the. Um, Scout who found him, he was very young, and the scout convinced them to keep him and said, no, I think there's something there, I think he's growing, I think we have to be patient and let him develop. And so they decided to keep him. And last year, that kid, whose name was Gareth Bale, was sold to Real Madrid for $120 million. Gareth Bale, a man who's considered the fastest soccer player on the planet, was the seventh fastest kid on his team when he was 15. And so when people tell me that, oh, I'm a coach who identifies nine-year-olds and I know which kids are going to make it, so I'm only going to keep these ten and I'm going to just coach them, you know, it's just not true. It doesn't work that way. So we have to understand that focusing on winning really young, that doesn't help. Focusing on excellence helps. And excellence is the process of getting better. It's getting 1% better every day. Is winning and losing. Is failing and getting up and learning from failure. This is what makes athletes high performers, not winning all their games. And then the third thing is this. When we specialize early, when we get on the winning team, there's the big, the big myth. Because this is an investment in a future athletic scholarship. So here's what the NCAA tells us. The NCAA tells us that about 1 to 2% of high school athletes go on to play a college sport. 1 to 2%. And of that 1 to 2%, only a small percentage get a scholarship. And the average scholarship is about $11,000 a year. So there's families that are in some sports that are investing 10, 20, $30,000 a year in youth sports thinking that they're going to get this at the back end. It just doesn't happen. And the scary thing is there's actually been some surveys done of high schools, and again, 1% of senior athletes, or 1% of athletes go on to play in college, 30 to 50% of their parents think that they're going to get a scholarship. 
And that divide is what's incredibly, incredibly damaging. So we have to be aware of this. We can't be afraid when everyone's going down a path that isn't supported by anything except fear. And fear is let your kids play, let them develop, be patient. Let them play lots of sports so they find one that is <coughs> physically and socially and psychologically a good match for them. Right? And let sports be an investment in character development. Let sports be a place where they get good, positive role models, get coaches who treat them and value them as human beings, not a, not a piece of a machine that wins trophies. And if they happen to have the genetics and the drive, the psychology to, to be a, an elite athlete, then that's icing on the cake. But we have to bring some balance back. Okay? So how can we do that? Well, I think it's really important to understand the psychology of performance. And um, there's a man named Timothy Galway. He, he wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis 30 years ago. And he comes up with this little equation I really like. It says performance equals potential minus interference. How an athlete performs is their potential, which is their genetics and their practice and their coaching, minus the things that interfere with it. And the single greatest thing that interferes with performance is a bad state of mind. And we as coaches and we as parents are the ones who are primarily responsible for an athlete's state of mind. Now when I was a young coach, I used to think that my job was to just pile as much on my kids as possible. We were bad at set plays, let me teach you more. We were struggling with tactics. Let me make it more confusing. And then I realized that my job was to strip away as much of this as possible. To strip away the things they feared and just let them play and let them play without pressure, let them play without stress, let them play without fear. And boy, did they start playing better. See, what we have to ask ourselves is, are we interfering with our kids? And just like our friend, the lady in red, Right, who's yelling and screaming on every play to go, go, go. We have to understand this. In the sport of soccer, a player is making about two conscious decisions per set. Think about that. Your son, your daughter is going, do I step? Do I drop? Do I move in? Do I move out? Do I pass? Do I dribble? Do I cross? Do I shoot? Do I delay? Do I tackle? So how many additional decisions can they make on top of that? And how much input are they going to take from us as coaches or parents to make those decisions? They do one of two things. They either listen to us and fail to do what's happening in the game, what's required them, or they ignore us, which makes us angry, and then we keep yelling at them until they look at us, and then what do we say? What are you doing? Keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> so scientists, um, neuroscientists have actually coined, um, the, they, they've learned more about the brain in the last five years than the previous 500. And what they've learned is that there, there's different parts of the brain used for different thinking. There's two types of thinking uh, that we use in sports. One would be called bottom-up thinking and one's top-down thinking. So bottom-up thinking would be the habits that we develop through continuous practice. So for instance, if you play tennis for a long time, you're not thinking about the mechanics of your stroke every time you're hitting a ball. If I ask someone to play soccer with me up here and pass the ball, I'm not thinking about, do I lock my ankle, do I bend my knee, where do I point my toe? Because I've done it so many thousands of times that it does not require thought. And then we have what's called top-down thinking. And top-down thinking is the conscious decisions that an athlete makes. Do I turn when everyone expects me to play it back? Do I shoot when everyone thinks I'm going to cross? And the best players have done so much practice that so many things don't require any thought, they just happen instinctively. The player, the David Beckham with the Wayne Rooney, who picks his head up at midfield and hits a shot that no one's expecting in sports. So what neuroscientists have done is they've actually tested performance of people and what happens when you take that bottom-up stuff, those habits that don't require thought, and you add thought to them. So what they've done is they've taken professional soccer players and had them dribble through a series of cones and timed them. And then they had them do it again, but they said, while you're dribbling through, I would like you to think about what part of your foot you're using on each touch. Am I using the inside? Am I using the outside? Am I using the bottom of my foot? And guess what happened to everyone's time? Went down. 
They do it with baseball players. Let's see how you hit the ball, and then let's see how you hit it when you're thinking about is my swing on a downward or an upward trajectory. Performance went down. So every time we are talking to a player who's about to cross a ball and we're yelling at him to shoot, or we're telling someone who's about to pass to dribble, what we're doing has been shown by scientists is we are interfering with how our kids are playing. Now, when I ask kids, a lot of places I go, I, I meet with athletes. And when I ask them, well, what would you like, you know, first of all, would you like your parents to come to your game or not? And they go, well, the typical teenager, I don't know. <laughs> then I ask them, if your parents can come, what should they say? And you know what the number one answer is? Nothing. nothing. Please say nothing. <laughs> and they say, and if you have to say something, Make it positive, and please don't yell at the referee, whatever you do. <laughs> this is what our kids say. So, I think it's, you know, what scientists are telling now is we need to listen to that. And again, this is a parent thing, this is a coach thing too, to let the game belong to them. So, the other thing that interferes with performance is, is what we call a bad mindset. Is anyone, anyone familiar with the work of Carol Dweck? Anyone here? Okay, a couple of people, excellent. Harold Dweck is a researcher from Stanford University. And Dweck's seminal work is called Mindset. And what she's found in 30 years of studying performance and motivation is that anyone has, in any achievement activity, has two types of mindset, a fixed or a growth. Now, a fixed mindset individual looks at every activity as a reflection of their innate and their unchangeable ability. So listen to these statements and see if this is something that your son or your daughter might say. I failed my math test. I'm just not good at math. I got cut from the soccer team or I lost my starting spot. I'm just not good at soccer. Nobody likes me. These are fixed mindset statements because effort has nothing to do with it. And these are the average performing mindset. Now what Dweck has found is that there are now the growth mindset. Growth mindset people are all about the process. I failed my math test, I need to study. I lost my starting spot on the sports team, I need to practice more. And we all know that that's what makes you better. And what I am today has nothing to do with what I might be next month or next year if I work hard and I apply myself. And anything can be learned. This is the growth mindset. And what Dweck found is that these mindsets, you can have different mindsets in different parts of your life, and they can be changed. But most mindsets are instilled by how we praise our kids. Now we live in a place where sometimes we're like, oh, praise, praise, praise our kids, praise our kids. Well, here's what she found. When you praise children for their ability, you instill a fixed mindset. You're so smart, you're so talented, you're so good looking. What you're telling them is that your praise is only received from an outcome. And it's often an outcome that they have no control over. But when you praise your children for their effort, you instill this growth mindset. And so one of her most famous studies, she worked with about 400 middle school kids in New York. And what she did was she, she gave them a puzzle test. And then for 200 of them, she said, you did well on this test, you must be smart. The other, she said, you must have worked hard. A couple simple words of praise. Then she gave them three subsequent tests, each one getting progressively harder. And the kids who were praised, the kids who got praised for their outcome, kids who were praised for being smart, they gave up quicker, and they got less enjoyment out of the difficult activity. The children who were praised for working hard stuck with it longer, got more enjoyment, no one did that well because the test got very hard, but then here was the big finding. She went back at the end, and she gave them an easier test than the first one. And the children who were praised for ability, their scores went down 20%. And the children who were praised for effort, their scores went up 30%. So a few simple words of praise had a huge difference in performance. Because what it taught them was you were praised when you apply yourself. You were praised when you work hard. You get praised when you take care of the things that you control. So it's an amazing finding. Now, when I 
Before I read this book, these were called uncoachable kids, and these were called coachable kids. And I say that because I didn't really realize that it wasn't my coaching, it wasn't what I was saying, it was what they were hearing. When I told a fixed mindset boy or girl, hey, instead of dribbling the ball to the middle, can you open your hips and maybe play a pass up the line? What he or she heard was, I'm not very good because if I was good, coach wouldn't have to coach me. And the growth mindset kid heard, hey, coach is trying to make me better. And when I learned that, I just had to really pay attention to how those kids reacted. And I had to make sure that all my praise was focused on the effort and the focus they were putting in. I really started reaching a lot more players than I'd ever reached in the past. So when you are praising your kids, when you're talking to your kids, focus on their effort. Give them this growth mindset, because that's the mindset of high performers. And then the last piece of the psychological piece is this. You have to look at the environment. You guys are going to like this picture. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Thank you for that, Carson. Um, I, he gave me permission to use this a while ago, and uh, I love this picture. Um, because why do kids play sports? Why, why? And, and children play according to numerous studies all over the world. The one I always say is Michigan State University, about 20,000 kids. They play because it's fun. They play because they're with their friends. They play because they enjoy the excitement of competition and they like to learn. Now, kids like to win. They value winning. They naturally try to win. Most kids are competitive. When the game's over, five minutes later, they're, they're not too worried about it. In this study, for, for boys 12 and up, winning came in at number seven on reasons why they play. And it came at number 10 for girls. So there's six to nine reasons more important than winning why they show up and play. And I love this picture, and I thank your club for the use of it, because when I look at that, and I, and I, I don't know if the, the mom or dad of this child is here, but I'm pretty sure he's not discussing tactics right now. <laughs> Getting a, a different angle of the player he's about to compete against. And that's okay, because he's nine or 10 or whatever it is. He's having fun. Now, I don't advocate having your 16-year-old lay upside down on the bench. It's different. But we have to remember why the kids are there. And by the same token, why do they quit? According to the study, they quit because of a fear of making mistakes. They quit because they're getting criticized and yelled at for making those mistakes. They quit because they don't get to play because of an emphasis on them. There's a study by the Josephian Institute that found that 90% of children said they would rather play on a losing team than sit the bench on a winning team. 90%. I don't know that there's 9 out of 10 parents who would feel the same way, but this is what kids are. They just want to play. They just want to play. They just want to feel like they're contributing. Brendan Rogers, the coach of Liverpool, he says, he says, the biggest thing a coach can do as a player is make me feel important. Give me a role. Well, right now, if three out of four kids are dropping out of sports, it's because there's too much of this and not enough of this. And if we want to change that number, we want to keep our kids active for life. We've got to make it fun. We've got to make it exciting. And we've got to get rid of a lot of this stuff because this is why they're walking away. Now, there's a man named uh, Dr. Dan Friday. And Dan is the sports psychologist for U.S. soccer and USA hockey and USD team. He was in Utah. And I asked Dan, I said, well, who are, these, who are the kids they're studying here? Right? Are these top athletes? Are these just rep kids? He said, I thought the same thing. So he repeated the study with the youth national team athletes in soccer and hockey and skiing. And the results were exactly the same. The best youth hockey players, the best, best youth soccer players, they play because they, it's fun and they love it. And when they stop playing sports and they start working sports, they don't do very well. So we need to make sure our kids are playing. We need to make sure it's enjoyable. And so I have a video here for you. Um, if, if, if everything that I've been saying so far doesn't make any sense, well, let me just propose one more scenario to you. What if our kids came to our events, our tennis match, our golf match, our softball game, whatever we do, and treated us like we treat them? Oh, that would. Our friends at Hockey Canada have imagined this for us. Screw up, it's the big thing. What are you doing? You ran the 
Does anyone think that would help your golf game? <laughs> All right, so knowing that, well, how do we make these changes? How do we, how do we fix this, right? How do, we, how do we just take a step back and say, well, how can we actually help our kids? And this is our big failure. This was my biggest failure as a director of uh, youth sports organizations. Uh, and that's why I love working with uh, Elmhurst and love working with Carson and the coaches here because they're making an effort to do this. And that's help you. We need to help parents have a role. Not say, don't email me, don't call me, go away, leave me alone, I'm the coach. But say, you are the most influential person in your child's life. Here's how you can help so you make it better. And so in my book, uh, what I talk about in my research is these seven C's of high performance, right? Uh, how, where's confidence come from? Where does confidence come from? How do we communicate with kids? All that sort of stuff. How do we put the right environment for them? But I want to touch on a couple of those things tonight. Just kind of scratch the surface here and give you something to go with. So the first thing is this. We want our kids to play well. They have to have control over their experience. They have to have ownership. It has to belong to them and not to us. But the best sports scientists tell us is that athletes need three things to perform their best. They need autonomy, they need enjoyment, and they need intrinsic motivation. And all those things come together. And if the motivation comes from us, if all the driving comes from us, it doesn't work, no matter how much, quote, talent they have. And I think one of the best ways to give your kids control is through goal setting. Now, when I was a, a young coach, I used to do goal setting. I would look at my team, and I would set all the goals. And then I would yell and scream and push and prod all my players to my goals. And it never worked well. And then thankfully one day a 16 year old boy said to me, Coach, leave us alone. Like, we can't, you're the only one here who thinks we can win the league. We can't win the league. We suck. <laughs> <laughs> and my thought, I don't say that God was, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but he was right. And, and this was this epiphany moment for me where I said, wow, I never actually asked these players what they want out of this season. And how can I possibly coach someone if I don't know what they want? And so I started doing goal setting. But here's what I did. I, I did it a little bit differently. I would sit all the players down before the season and say, okay, give me three individual goals for yourself and three goals for your team. But then I would ask their moms and dads to do the same. I would say, what are three goals for your daughter or your son? And what are three goals for their team? And then before I would collect them, I would say, go home and sit down at your kitchen table and compare. Because what was amazing was how many parents <coughs> emailed me or called me after and said, my God, I had no idea what my son or what my daughter wanted out of sports. I had no idea. And sometimes the parents were just going, Man, you know, this is great, they're just with some good kids and a good coach, this is awesome. And then their daughter's goal say, I want to play at Stanford. And they're like, holy cow, you do? <laughs> and then there was the girls or the boys who said, man, I want to play, you know, I, I just, I don't even want to play in high school. And the parents are going, well, I think, uh, you know, she's on the path for the Olympics. <laughs> and that difference is probably the number one reason why I saw players drop out. Not, not players who weren't good, incredibly talented players who were just getting burned out and saw this, this massive gulf in goals between what their parents were pushing them towards and what they wanted out of sports. And it wasn't about their motivation or their ownership, it was what their parents wanted. So here's the difficult thing. What I encourage parents to do is this. Accept your kids' goals for play. Accept their goals. And you can talk about them, you can talk about maybe aiming a little bit higher, that's fine. But at the end of that conversation, the goals that got handed in to me had to be mutually agreed upon goals. Now as a parent, you are certainly well within your rights if, if your child says, you know what, I don't want to do any extra practice, I don't even want to go to two practices a week, to say I'm not going to spend thousands of dollars on travel soccer or travel hockey or whatever, that's totally fine. But you have to accept your kids' goals. And, and the beautiful thing is that once you do, 
How do you get to push them? And, and kids need to be pushed. Jim Taylor is a sports psychologist. He says, children are creatures of inertia. And they tend to stay at rest until they're put in motion. And then they tend to stay in motion. <laughs> and it's our job to put them in motion. And it's so much easier to put them in motion when what we're doing is reminding them of what they've asked for. We're reminding them of their goals. We're saying, if you are going to do this, and you said you want to do this because it's written right here and it's stuck up on your wall, then do it right. Do it right. Go to an extra practice. Get up before school and go for a run. Whatever it is, that's what's going to make a kid better, but it's got to be their goals. And when I started doing this with my teams, it was great because now I knew what they wanted. And I would tally them up and I would tell them, hey, this is, this is your, you know, these are the team goals. We want 100% commitment in practice. We want better effort. We want to win a state cup. We want to win a regional championship. Man, that's great. And I also knew what every individual kid's goals were. So you know what? I didn't coach soccer anymore. I coached Billy, and I coached Josh, and I coached Steve. And I coached the child, not the sport. Because they had different goals and aspirations for the sport. And I'm going to treat a kid who wants to play in the Pac-12 differently from a kid who says, I'm going to be done, you know, I, I don't want to even play in college. But I'm going to be here and support my friends. Those are two different things, and I need to know that. And the best part was when I knew what my players' goals were, then what I could do was, I would just say, stop. Practice isn't good today. Should we reset goals? Should we do this again? Is this what's going to get us a state championship? Is this going to get us a regional championship? And nine times out of ten, all the players said, there's no coach. You're right, we'll make it better. No yelling, no screaming. Just reminding them of what they asked to be coached towards. How they asked to be coached. It made my life less stressful. It made their lives less stressful. And, and all my teams and all my players did much better because I became a much better coach. So give your kids control. Give them ownership. Massive step. Number two is allow them to fail. We have to allow our children to fail. We are now living in a world where our kids are protected from failure in school, in sport, in life. And this is not healthy. The only way to overcome the fear of failure it's not by success, it's through failure. And so many kids are afraid of failure. There's an amazing book called Overachievers about um, kids, you know, kids, uh, high school kids under pressure and uh, I think it's in Bethesda, Maryland. Right? There's a movie called The Race to Nowhere. And, and so many kids are afraid of failing because they've never failed before. And sports is the perfect place to teach our kids how to fail and make it safe and help them learn from that failure. Now, the, the words that psychologists are using these days is sort of two types of parents. All right, they call one the helicopter parent. We've heard this term, right? They hover over, and every time there's an obstacle, they pluck their kid out. They get rid of the coach. They try to get rid of the teacher. They change the class instead of saying to their child, what's good about this? What can you learn from this? And then the other term I learned, which I really, really like, is the lawnmower parent, who just mows down all the obstacles. <laughs> And so I, I have another video for you here from our friends at Hockey Canada, and I'm not totally sure if it fits the presentation, but I just really like it, so I'm going to play it anyway. It's funny. And this is the Hockey Canada version of the lawnmower parent. Hi. <laughs> this kid's potato sack doesn't look regulation to me. Excuse me? Well, it's got a wider base, and that's totally unfair to my kid, right? I don't want to protest. Well, look, it's... It's two inches higher. Look at those hand grips. It's not regulation. Regulation? Look, you know what else? I want a urine sample from this kid. He looks a little beefy for a five-year-old. They're going down, buddy. Don't be that guy. Awesome. So, one other thing about failure is this. Uh, one of the most important places we have to let our kids fail arrive home after games. I have a friend named Bruce Brown. Uh, he runs an organization called Proactive Coaching. Uh, he's been a great friend and mentor uh, to me, kind of doing what I do here for the last 20 or 30 years. And during that time, Bruce has conducted many, many athlete exit interviews when they are done with sports, whether they're middle schoolers or college athletes. And he asked them, what is your worst memory of new sports? <coughs> 
They're riding home after the game. Because this is a time when they are physically and emotionally exhausted. And oftentimes we are emotionally drained or we're all amped up. And yet this is the time when so many parents choose to criticize or critique our kids' performance. Or their coach or their teammates. And what the kids tell us is, you know what, there's probably not a less teachable moment than this one. Now, every kid is different. Some kids don't mind talking about it. I, I didn't mind talking to my dad about it. My brother hated it. And a mom in Minnesota, she had twin daughters. One would ride home with her to not talk about it. The other would ride home with her dad so she talked about the game. <laughs> but every kid is different. Now, if your son or your daughter does something during that game that is not acceptable at home, right? If they spit on someone, if they punch someone, if they curse the referee, deal with that in the car at home. Not as a segue to discuss performance, but father or mother to child. We do not do that in our family. But if your kids don't bring up the game, don't bring it up. Bring it up later on. Bring it up later on. This is what our kids ask us to do. And if they bring it up, and then they stop talking, let it go. And I was talking to a gentleman last night, um, uh, and it, I think it was your club president, he was saying that um, his advice to people is, just don't talk about it. And he says, I, I guarantee you within 30 days, your, your child will start bringing it up. Because they're not getting grilled, and now it's on their terms. So I think this is an incredibly important advice. If you want the sports experience to be better for your kids, let them have the ride home. And now this is, I think, it's one of the hardest things to do um, because it's so hard to get FaceTime with our kids, right? And now they're locked in the car, they're stuck in traffic, they're not going anywhere, and we're like, yes, we're out. <laughs> but what our kids are telling us is, no, we don't, please don't. Not now. Find me later, have a conversation, say, hey, I want to talk about this, but I know we're both tired, we're both emotional. So when you're ready to talk about it, come to me and let's talk. Now this is hard. I, I, wanna, I, I love the story. When I started coaching my son, PJ, he was five years old or so, I was his first soccer coach. And his first ever game, he goes to practice, he likes it, he goes to always want to play in the yard. And so in his first game, he walks out in the field and he's like, walks out and goes, Dad, I don't want to play. And he turns and walks off. And I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, whatever, you know, I'm going to be... I'm going to be the big man. But when he did it again the second week, I was kind of upset. I was kind of embarrassed. I'm thinking, wow, what are people thinking of me? I'm supposed to be the all-star coach and my own five-year-old won't play. And he's perfectly happy. He found a cricket. <laughs> he's playing under a tree. He's totally cool. I'm the only one who's bothered by this. So we get in the car after, and... Um, my, I, I turn around and so, uh, TJ, and all of a sudden I get, wham, a karate chop across the chest from my wife sitting next to me. And I turned to her and I was like, what was that for? She goes, so she was like, really? Didn't you just write a whole book about this? <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. And so I, I said nothing. The next week he played, he's played ever since. What other result could I have from that? But it was hard. You know, it's, it's hard to take my own advice sometimes. So let the ride home belong to your kids. Let them fail. Now the third thing is this. Every sports psychologist, every sociologist, every child development person, when I ask them, what should you say to your kids after a game? This was something, again, I learned from my friend Bruce Brown 10 years ago. They say some version of this, the five most important words. I love watching you play. When you tell your kids, I love watching you play, what you're telling them is that your love for them is not dependent on their performance. It's not dependent on whether the team wins or loses, or whether they played well or didn't play well. Your love for them is unconditional. And that they are not responsible for your happiness. And it's an incredibly freeing thing for kids to know that they're loved. And that they're not going to be treated differently whether they win or lose. Now it seems like a very, very simple concept, but it's the most powerful. And if you take nothing from tonight except this, it will make a difference. It makes a difference for everyone I've talked to. I get more emails and more phone calls about these five words than anything else. 
not just from moms and dads, but elite coaches. The men's tennis coach at USC, Peter Smith, he's won five NCAA championships. He said those five words changed his whole family dynamic. Because he lives in Southern Cal, and actually, even though he's a, a famous tennis coach, he can't actually afford to pay anyone else to coach his kids. <laughs> so he has to do it. And he said it was affecting their relationship until he started just telling them, I love watching him play. And when he did, not only was it better off the court, but they played better and they played longer. And then I have a friend named Stephanie, and um, Stephanie has, well, she has, her oldest son is a very, very good soccer player. He's a U.S. national team kid. He's actually had a tryout for Real Madrid. He's very, very talented. She had two younger boys, and they were not quite as strong players. Great, they were good players, but not as good as their older brother. And so Stephanie came to me. The whole rat race of sports was killing her. Uh, going here or there, she's angry at refs, angry at coaches, wondering why her kids aren't doing well, yelling at them, yelling at everyone, yelling at me. And she came up to me when I was writing my book. She said, uh, can you give me, just give me your best piece of advice because this is killing me right now. And I said, Steph, just love watching your kids play. That's it. She looks at me and she's like, really? That's the best you got? <laughs> she goes, you're my friend, but you're not going to sell any books with that joke. <laughs> and so I said, okay. And then a year later, I got a letter from her, and, and this is what it said. You're going to tell me that you love watching my kids play, and that's the only thing I say to them after a game. Don't say anything about how they play or wins and losses, just that it's such a privilege and honor to watch them. And it's amazing how each time I say it, it becomes more true and more impactful for even me. This opened my eyes to a whole other kind of joy and contempt. I love watching you play. It changed everything for Stephanie and her family. Her boys played with freedom. They played more. They tried more sports. There's one son who goes to OVP tryouts over here just so he can get cut. Let's see if he got better. He stopped fearing failure. He stopped fearing that he was disappointing his mom. So try this with your kids. And if you're doing it, keep at it. And if you're not, it's a great thing to start. It doesn't matter how old they are. But this makes a difference. All right, so where do we go from here? What do we do? How do, how, how do we take this message? Show of hands, how many people, or just laugh, are thinking of someone who should be here tonight and is not? <laughs> Don't put your hand up right now on the second question. How many of you are married to that person? <laughs> All right, there are people that we know make our kids' sports experiences a really bad one. Some of them are coaches, some of them are parents. And I used to think that we needed to take this message and, and shove it in our face. And, and actually now I don't believe that at all. What I, what I now believe is this. I believe that the problem is not that there's enough good coaches or enough good parents. I think there's too many. And because there's so many of us, we aren't doing anything. It's a very famous story uh, in the 1960s in New York City there's a famous murder case called Kitty Genovese, and this woman was stabbed outside her apartment building 30, 30 times or something and eventually died, while 30 neighbors looked out the window and watched it happen, and nobody called the police. And it became this very famous story for uh, the, you know, the inhumanity of living in a big city. But then these psychologists did a study, and what they found was that the reason no one called the police was that so many people witnessed the event. If one person had saw it, she or he would have probably called. But everyone else assumed someone else would do something. And so the lesson for us is this. We need to take this message and find someone who thinks like us. Find someone who is a good parent, who's positive, who's saying, man, this, maybe this sports thing is a little bit crazy. What do I do about it? And give them this message. And if everyone here shared it with one person or two people, think how quickly you can spread, not only to your club, but to your community. And that's how we change it. And so I want one last video for you here, and this is how we make a movement. How do we make a movement? How do we make a change in the game movement? This one's called The First Follower. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. 
This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So he takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and the crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. But over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of a shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So, I'm happy to be the lone nut. I will not dance. I will not take off my shirt. But, it's not about me. It's about all of you. It's about being that first follower. Imagine what it would be like if it wasn't risky to just be quiet on the sidelines, to let your kids play their best, to let sports belong to them, to let them follow their own path, to let them try lots of stuff and find the thing that's the best fit for them. This is the, the, the world that we, that we need in sports. And here's why. I talked about my daughter Maggie and the game that sort of changed my perspective three years ago. This was taken that day. This is them. They were called the unicorns, this team. And the, my Maggie unicorns, the third one in on the left. And when I look at these girls and I, and I look at the smiles on their faces and I, and I know the tremendously positive impact that sports can have on their lives, not only as athletes, not only as active people, but off the field and the lessons they can learn, and the people they can become because of sports, then I, I know it's time to change your sports. It's time to change the game. It's time for all of us to just take a little bit of action, find someone or two people who think like you, and make it not risky to follow. And if we do that, if we just start by simply telling our kids, I love watching you play, we can change youth sports, we can give it back to our kids. And this is something that really, really, really needs to happen. So thank you so much. I don't know where Carson is, but Carson, we have time for questions? Awesome. So we do have time for questions. Um, I just want to give you my contact info as well. Um, I know you guys share a lot of my stuff there, but that's my website, Change the Game Project, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I, you know, would love to share this message. I do a daily Facebook post, just kind of that daily reminder. And, and then on your way out, if you'd like to get a book, I have some discounted books. They're $15. They'll 
they'll be outside and I'm happy to sign it for you if you want. And then if you're interested in this uh, sports specialization thing, on my website is a book I put together called Is It Wise to Specialize? And it's about 30, 40 pages, just an ebook, just downloadable, about five dollars, and it's all about um, all the science and psychology and sociology of sports specialization. So if you run into that program, you run into that person who says to you, you know, you need to do this, you need to go down this path. Now you have the latest and greatest stuff to, to give yourself sort of the confidence that even if everyone else is doing it, I'm going to do what's right for my kid. So, any questions? The first follower always asks a question. <laughs> Anyone? Yes? Yeah, so great question. The question is, you know, what if I want to cheer uh, my kid on or that? So the first thing I say is, if you're unsure, ask your son or your daughter, what would you like me to do? And if they say, please don't say anything, then you have to respect that decision of theirs, right? Um, and then again, what do they say? If you have to say something, make it positive, right? Make it supportive. A lot of kids say, you know what, cheer, you know, especially when they're younger, cheer for the other team too. Right? Cheer, cheer for me, cheer for the other team. Just, just cheer. Just make it good. Because, you know, really probably up until age 11, the thing they remember most about each game is what the snack was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? I, I agree with your view on specialization, but how can you address for players, when coaches are looking at kids in eighth grade, uh, college coaches are looking at kids in eighth grade, giving scholarships or coaching kids in their freshmen, yet many kids will not make, will not mature until their junior, senior, maybe freshman year in college to really show their, their potential. Yeah, great question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, so you have a kid who they, when a win parent sees another one getting looked at by a coach in college, they say, well, now we need to. Uh, yeah, and so so the question is, you know, what happens, especially in these sports? Women's soccer is one of them. Lacrosse is getting very bad, where where kids are getting recruited younger and younger and younger. Um, first of all, I've never met a college coach, who a women's soccer college coach, who thinks it's a good thing that they're watching eighth graders play. They all hate it, but no one's willing to do anything about it, which is really sad. Because the idea that somehow you're going to commit money to a player that you're going to be coaching four years from now, I think is crazy. Because exactly like you said, right, what, you know, what are they, you know, how do you know what they're going to look like? You don't. If Gareth Bale can barely be cut from Southampton at 15 and then can be playing for the Welsh national team a year and a half later, you know, if you looked at that 15-year-old, you might not have taken it. So here's my thoughts. Number one, when you're talking about sort of middle school age kids, right, that's an age where, where if a kid wants to go down the path and say, hey, I think I want to go down the soccer path or baseball or whatever sport, it's not, it's not too bad because they are mature enough to make that decision. What scares me is when people decide at eight years old, well, my kid only likes soccer. I'm like, my kid only likes mac and cheese. <laughs> but I know it's not good for him. And so I make them eat vegetables. And then as a parent, we have to say, when well, my kid's young, even if they say, I only want to do this, we say, that's not good for you. And playing basketball or doing other things, you can tumble in or whatever, that's good psychologically, it's good cognitively, it's good physically to do other things. But if your kid says, I own this, I want to do this, that's not a bad thing. Um, the other thing is this. It's a very hard thing on the girls' side, especially where they're picking these athletes up so young. Um, yet, I've never seen a very, very good player go wanting. I've never seen a very, very good player who, who's 18 and is just tearing it up 
people say, no, you know what, we didn't get her at 14, forget it. Now, she might not go to the exact school that she wants to go to, but someone, <coughs> someone will find her. Um, or that school will say, my God, where did you come from? We don't have the money for you this year, but maybe we have for you next year. So being patient in the development process, I mean, you know, who has, who has an eighth grader here or, you know, that middle school kid? Do they know where they want to go to college? Have they even thought about college yet? And so these kids who get scholarship offers and they've never even been on a campus is crazy to me. How could you possibly say, I'm going to spend four years of my life at a place where I've never been? And so this is really, really sad. So I think as parents, this is where I think it's important that we, that we take this back and, and we're brave and we're not afraid. And, and, and sometimes, uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes we lie to each other and we say, oh, my kid got a full scholarship. No, she didn't. <laughs> no, because I talked to the coach and I know what she got. But oh no, that, you know, Kristen's, Kristen's mom said she got a full scholarship. No, I know she didn't. So this is where we have to be patient and find the right place. That degree, that school, what they learn there, the connections they make, that has to last a lifetime. They might only play sports for three or four more years. So do what's right. Now, you know, when I come to a school like this, right, a huge high school, 3,000 kids, playing a school sport, that kind of fits into it too, right? If we don't specialize early, we might not make the school team. And it might be, it might be a reality. There's certainly something to say that the kids who make the school teams at the big giant high school have oftentimes put a lot more into it. But I think that's where as a parent you have to say, well, here's what all this stuff says. So if I want to make that school team, my kid has to specialize, is probably going to have a very, very bad injury is, has a very high chance of burning out, it's a very high chance of quit, quitting, it's a very high chance of getting a maladaptive behavior. And is that worth making the school team? Is, it, is that worth the experience? And yes, you might do it. But, but it's kind of like golf, right? They, they say in golf that 100% of, of, of short putts don't go in. Right? Well, 100% of kids who quit at 13 don't play high school sports. So you have to make sure all the baskets are full. You have to make sure that they want to be there and there's psychological stuff. So if your kid gets injured, if all they've done is play soccer, and that's their social group, and then they get hurt and they can't play again, they have a lot of issues outside of soccer. I met a dad, he didn't even know what he did. He was telling the story about how he messed up his kid's sports career and how his, his, his daughter had only done soccer six days a week, living in Connecticut, six days a week, soccer, soccer, soccer. Those were friends, nothing with school, nothing with theater, nothing with music. And a week before her 11th birthday, she tore her ACL and never played again. And it took two years to get her a friend group again. All the whole middle school years were miserable for her. So her whole social group was gone. Because that was her only identity. So this is where we have to be careful. This is where, as parents, sometimes we're making very difficult decisions. And sometimes it's not even a question of specialization. I mean, I, I deal with people all the time who say, um, you know, my mom is 90 years old, and uh, she's on her deathbed, and it's her birthday, and our coach says we can't go because we have a tournament. What should we do? <laughs> go. I mean, again, think about that coach. Like, is that who you want your kid around? If that's what their opinion is? You know, I don't care if your grandma's going to die. We have the uh, arranged cup. Give me, give me a break. <laughs> So, hope that. And I think we're up to, let's say your kid says they want to specialize. I want to do this now. And I said, no, you're too young. And so, what age do you say, okay, I can Again, I, I think the, when we're talking about soccer, we're talking about the middle school ages. But I think maturity is a far more important thing than age. So, are they mature enough to make this decision and say, yes, I want to do this. This belongs to me. And then number two, um, even if they say that I just want to be focused on soccer as the only organized sport I play, they still need to be doing that other stuff. I think every kid can benefit from doing yoga. I, I know I should wish I did yoga a lot. I mean, everyone's got tight hamstrings, right? I mean, yoga is a great crossover sport mentally and, and physically for stretching, for strength, for core strength. So finding a different sport and also making sure that they have time off. Um, I don't know who James Andrews is, orthopedic surgeon, very famous orthopedic surgeon. Um, he just wrote uh, a book 
called any given Monday about youth sports injuries. James Andrews has operated on every sports star you've ever heard of who's gotten hurt. He's 60, 62 years old. He has absolutely no reason to write a book about these sports. But he's so worried about what he sees in his office every Monday with kids coming in with overuse injuries and, and injuries that they only used to see in college kids now in 12 year olds. Baseball pitchers who throw more innings a year than major leaguers. Soccer kids who haven't had a day off. Track kids who haven't had a day off. And so when someone like James Andrews stands up and says, you know what, every kid needs three months off, I listen for my kids. They need three months off from a sport. Right? That will help them. Now when I talk to college coaches and they talk about recruiting kids, I just did a radio interview with a baseball coach at Vanderbilt. His name's Tim Corbin. They just won the NCAA. And he said, um, if he's looking at two kids, and one 18-year-old kid or 17-year-old kid has only played baseball, and the other kid, who maybe is not quite as good, has played a lot of sports, he says, you know what, I'm going with the other kid. Because this kid's probably tapped out. I'm seeing them at their peak, whereas this kid has room to grow. And this kid might be burning out because all he's done is baseball, 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 but this kid has probably said, man, I've done a lot of sports, but man, I want to do baseball now. And I met another dad who, who called me and his son had just gotten drafted by the Baltimore Orioles. And Buck Showalter, the manager, said the same thing. He said, if your kid wasn't a multi-sport athlete, we wouldn't have picked him. Because we would have figured he was already as good as he was going to be. But because he did, we said, we think there's an upside. And he's going to be a better athlete for it. Someone was telling me today, they said, you know, the biggest problem is college coaches say, these kids come in and they play lots of baseball. But they can't move. They can't run. They can't move their feet. Got all the baseball skills, but they're not athletes anymore. So I, I think again, you go down that path and say, you know, this is what the science says. This is what the best stuff says for me, um, and I'm going to help you make that decision. But I'm going to let you own it, and I'm going to support you in that. There's no exact answer. So, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk for a couple minutes. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Just a quick question. I like what you said about goal setting and having. Set the goals um, for younger kids, particularly. You know, I think the first goal is going to be win every game, and the second goal is going to be score each goal in the game. So, mm -hmm. how, how can you uh, help guide them to the right goal without making them scores? Yeah, awesome. So, what you can teach kids is this idea of you know smart goals. They call them, right specific and measurable and timely and all that. So, so or another word you can say is you, we're not making goals; we're making commitments. Right? I want to score 18 goals, great. What are you going to do every day so that you score 18 goals? That's not telling them what the goal is. That's using your, your maturity to say, you can't just, you know, I want to score 18 goals means nothing. I want to practice for 20 minutes on my finishing three times a week. That's a goal. Right? That's something that's specific and measurable that you can say that will help you score 18 goals. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. You guys were.